Well, hello. My name is Jacob Jansen. I am a cultural anthropology major here at the University of Oregon, but I also pursue minor degrees in Middle East and North African studies and uh, food studies. The title of my project for today is uh, Complicating Autonomy Through Empowering Agency, Honeybees at the Center of Conflict. It's uh, sort of part of a series that I've been working on, which started in 2016 with uh, actually food studies capstone paper. Um, and this looked at sort of a case study approach to beekeeping in Gozo, Malta. Uh, Malta is south of Italy. It's uh, about 122 square miles. So looking at questions of space and place and how beekeepers and bees fit within that space was really important to me. I did not receive funding for my research the first time around when I went in 2016. But in 2017, I actually got accepted back into a program that I pursued, which was uh, Off the Beaten Track. It's a program in Gozo, Malta. It's the longest standing field school actually in the world for applied anthropology. And uh, I went there in 2016, was accepted back in 2017 as a staff member. So I got my lodging and stuff like that paid for. What attracted me to this project, I think in general, was actually sort of looking at how I could integrate anthropology um, into a cross-disciplinary approach. So environmental studies on the one hand with honeybees and beekeeping, but then also the social approach of, well, the bees have their keepers, the beekeepers. So sort of mixing these methods of working with nature but also working with people uh, got me in this really interesting place where this dichotomy between nature and culture, which has been debated since Aristotle, uh, that dichotomy isn't so explicit for me. I'm more so put in a center where nature and culture are constantly mixing, um, and that's actually the sort of primary topic of this paper that I'll be talking about today at the Research Symposium, uh, which is how when nature and culture blend, so much so where you know endemic species, for example, these things are naturally constituted, but also socially. Um, how classifying an endemic species can actually lead to conflict. And that is what my presentation today is about. Um, and sort of more holistically going forward into my research, hopefully with a PhD, I'll continue to work on um, beekeeping and anthropology within the context of Gozo, but also the world to see how we can approach these issues of conflict, but then also species and endemicness um, from both a social and biological perspective. My primary hypothesis or sort of theory for the project uh, that I'm working on at the moment is looking at sort of an um, approach to how honeybees have been constructed. Uh, the honeybee that we use today, Apis mellifera, uh, it's part of a colonial pursuit in a lot of ways, um, which actually derived from Britain, where honeybees were constructed physiologically for certain agricultural capacities. Um, when we think about how a honeybee is physiologically shaped, we often have to return to questions of, well, how did capitalism, in a lot of ways, get that species to be where it is today? Um, so when we think of questions of how much honey is the bee going to yield, uh, what sort of living capacity is it in, these were all sort of questions that, at the time, weren't intentionally thinking, oh, let's go at this with a capitalistic approach. It was like any civilization, how can we increase the expectancy of this particular species, the, the expectancy of yield of honey? Um, but going into the future, it has certainly turned into this situation where Apis mellifera now is a part of the agricultural industrial complex. So um, the honeybee itself is has been physiologically shaped, certainly, but also socially in the way that we think about this animal um, sort of through capitalistic means. Um, so the hypothesis then for this project, complicating uh, autonomy by empowering agency, is looking at questions of how can we complicate this notion of the honeybee um, within this capitalistic model where we are actually putting questions of human agency onto a non-human uh, subject. And for me, that's really interesting because then we start getting into questions of, well, what's the difference between nature and culture? What are the ways that we can blur these lines? 
um, by simply challenging the constructs, both agricultural, biological, chemistry, um, the, chemi the chemical model, the physical model, of how an organism has been constructed through agriculture and what social processes have led uh, for that to happen. Also going off of this idea of complicating the autonomy through empowering agency, um, bringing agency to an animal has been an idea that's been going since, uh, some would say Aristotle, but more recently in the 80s and 90s, this idea of a human-animal approach. Um, Anna Singh, she's a scholar who really sort of gives me my fervor in a lot of ways and makes me think about um, just the complexity of life. She had this idea of extending agency to animals whereby we're actually looking at organisms um, beyond humans with this very human lens um, in a way that we can empower that organism to then think about, well, how does it relate within our social context? Um, and that becomes really important when we have situations where honeybees, the endemicness of a honeybee is contested in a contact zone. Um, and sort of how do we go about resolving these issues where, let's say, in my field work in the context of Malta, honeybees have been imported since the 1990s from actually New Zealand. We had two or three different honeybee species that were being imported when this tragedy of varora mites, which um, is a mite that's classified as a pest, uh, was creating sort of this downfall for the local honeybee species. So at the time, people thought, all right, well, we have to protect this endemic species. So now fast forward to 2018, people are still importing honeybees. Um, and in fact, as of 2014, a Italian apiculturalist came into Malta. Malta is comprised of three islands, Malta, Gozo, and Camino. So this apicultural Italian, um, Italian apiculturalist, he set up his business in Gozo selling queen bees. This created a local tension because he's bringing in foreign honeybee species. And the people of Malta think, and it has been classified both through chromosomal testing but also mitochondrial, that there is a subspecies of Apis mellifera, the western honeybee, that is endemic to Malta, Apis mellifera retinari, the Maltese honeybee. So considering the Maltese honeybee in the context of somebody that's bringing a queen breeding business into the island of Gozo, this creates tension because now we're looking at factors of, well, is there an endemic honeybee species in Malta considering the fact that honeybees have been integrated into this place since the 90s and even before, perhaps. And challenging this question of endemicness, it becomes um, very critical, both in a biological sense, the knowledge constructions of that biology, but then also in a social sense, um, because now we have somebody, an Italian apiculturalist, who's saying, wait a minute, the honeybee species here, it might not be endemic, therefore, why is it wrong for me to sell my queen bees breed my queen bees here and sell them internationally. Whereas from a Maltese perspective, the honeybee is both an endemic local species, so why would you want to integrate a species within our species? Why would you want to complicate the endemicness and ruin it? Um, that's the Maltese approach. So looking at these questions then becomes both a biological one, what is endemic, how do we classify it, but then also social. What does it mean for the Maltese honeybee to be overtaken. Um, but now we're getting into questions of sovereignty and nationalism and identity because Malta, it is thought, um, through a complicated history of names, is actually named by the Greeks and Romans Melit or Melita, which to some they think means honey. So now linguistically, but then also culturally, we have this embedding of honey and honeybees within a culture. So if somebody's coming in to, let's say, breed queens and complicate the gene pool in other terms. Uh, this becomes then a threat to, in a lot of ways, I see it as a national symbol, the Maltese honeybee. My methods for sort of getting in this complicated uh, area of both biology and culture is where the anthropology comes in. So as somebody who wants to be an anthropologist and is a budding anthropologist, I'm conducting ethnographic interviews. So I'm actually going out, I'm talking to beekeepers, I'm spending time with them, both in their homes, at their hives, 
at Festas, which is a local Catholic gathering in Malta. Um, and we're spending time together thinking about and talking about, and one, how honeybees are today in a particular threat with climate change, um, which affects Malta because a place that's 122 square miles, you have to think about how do we utilize land, how do we utilize water, and all these questions are both human problems as well as bee problems. So um, in that sense, nature and culture are very much entwined. And talking these problems out with beekeepers, um, whether you're breeding queens or you're simply tending to your hives, um, that's sort of where I come in with my methods of you know, doing interviews, taking field notes, taking pictures, and getting this conversation going, this discourse, um, which really does challenge this nature and culture dichotomy, which for thousands of years has been argued as uh, belonging to a rightful separation. But I and then the scholars um, that have influenced me are certainly here to challenge that notion and say, well, wait a minute, why can't we bring nature and culture together, both within philosophical terms, but then also within scientific, when we're thinking about taxonomy and how to classify an endemic species. My key findings for the paper that I'll be presenting on today, Complicating Autonomy Through Empowering Agency, um, it's hard to put it into terms of, well, what, what are your results from this? Because it's part, of a, it's part of a holistic trajectory. But if anything, for me and for the people I worked with and the way that I've sort of hashed out this research, it's complicated, certainly, notions of autonomy. Is the honeybee autonomous? Does it have its own autonomy in the hive? Um, but also in consideration of the fact that beekeepers are having to sort of survive this animal. So in that sense, is the honeybee autonomous? Um, and we can complicate autonomy, notions of autonomy, through extending agency, as I said earlier, um, where Anna Singh encourages us to actually think about the honeybee in human terms um, and bringing in questions of race, identity, um, physiology in relation to the environment and how that environmental uh, subsistence is both an animal um, as well as a human concern and how those things are entangled. So... Results from this would be that really we need to be asking more questions. We need to be asking how do we constitute an organism based off of both natural terms but then also social terms. Um, and then a second question, which is an answer but provides further <laughs> questions, is how do we think about where those answers are coming from? How do, we, how do we think about where the answers of science are coming from? And how do we think about where the answers of of human answers are coming from, and how can we complicate these two fields to say, well, science says something on the one end, but people are saying something on the other. So how do we make these two fields um, talk to each other, basically? And then I would say overall, the significance of my research, um, both today with the paper and the work I've done before, but also going forward, uh, is really bringing a place in this conversation of specifically bees I mean, in the 1980s and 90s, we had this, this scare of the Africanized honeybee. And this became a problem both within an uh, apicultural, a beekeeping sense, but also a social sense. I mean, when we think about the Africanized honeybee, do we hear the language, as Anna Singh would say, of racialized identities, of the fact that with problems of race in the United States, this is then projecting and, and transcending the human and going into the animal realm because in reality people work with Africanized honeybees all over the place and it's not that much of a problem um, but when it is here in the United States um, that does become a problem and we want to ask why that is I want to ask why that is so the problem of race then it is also a um, human concern as it is for apiculturalists, it's, it's a honeybee concern as well. So this language of race then, it gets put into the honeybee realm both philosophically, socially, but also materially. The biology of honeybees is classified on taxonomy of race. The western honeybee and its subspecies, for example, the Maltese honeybee, um, the African honeybee, Asian honeybees. So we start immersing ourselves in this language that is very human, but at the same time uh, very animal because we have made it that way. So 
uh, my significance, my contribution to this discourse on beekeeping is challenging how we think about that taxonomy. Because when we're in a place like, say, the United States, where we have Africanized honeybees, and why that's so much of a problem, that same discourse is happening in, say, Malta, where you have somebody that's bringing in foreign bees, um, and there's a local endemic bee. There are biological concerns of you know, polluting the gene pool, but this also becomes a national problem in the sense that foreign bees are actually a risk to national sovereignty in a lot of ways, as I see it. Um, so yeah, looking at honeybees as symbols of not only nature, but ourselves, I think that's really important going forward. Um, and extending this beyond the context of beekeeping, looking at science not just as this objective, um, but rather subjective, where we can place a conversation of ourselves within the numbers, within the statistics, to show how science as an objective, it's not always straightforward, um, and it deserves to be complicated through culture. Because as I believe and so many others think, science in itself is culturally shaped. And I'll stand by that until the grave. So <laughs> in the context of beekeeping, um, creating a social conversation within the sciences is really important to me. And that's what I plan to focus on as I go forward, um, both within beekeeping, anthropology, and beyond.